Yeah, speaking. Is that Jason? Jason here, yes. How's it going, Steve? Not bad, thank you. How are you? Very good. You've been working hard recording a new album for Yes? Well, yeah. That's one of our main projects at the moment, yeah. Mm. So where, where are you up to in this uh, project? Well, we're not finished. Um, we won't be playing any of it until the summer on stage. But we're developing the album. Uh, we've got a lot of the titles all shaped up. Uh, you know, there's finessing, more vocals, uh, finals and mixing. and so a bit of a way to go, but, but a lot of the material is uh, standing the course. So would you say this recording session is going kind of like a magnification album or, you know, going back to the old roots of uh, Yes? Well, um, I, I pray it's not like magnification because although those albums turned out to be good, they were good after a great deal of difficulty. Um, fluid albums uh, are quite... Uh, I mean, the, the older albums, certainly, you know, we were blinded by our own... Uh, enjoyment for it and in the 70s when we made like Fragile and Close to the Edge in the same damn year you could see we were having a good time you know um, so I wouldn't say that this album's like either uh, I don't want to make albums like the last Yes albums they were they were tense uh, they were difficult they were problematic they went over budget they did everything that was wrong they didn't sound bad in the end but they were they was a bit like crawling across cut glass to make a record you know <laughs> Uh, they weren't easy. Now, this has not been anything as difficult as that, but it's had its own internals. Uh, you know, it's always had some internals, but uh, as you do with, with, you know, close quarters. But I would be fantasizing to say it's as dreamy, if you like, as the 70s. But it's it's good fun, and we're, we're working well together. And, uh, you know, it's, it's nice to be working with Trevor Horn. He, he's he's uh, uh, you know, an interesting guy that we've got special you know, kind of connections with, and, uh, you know, that, 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 that means it's, it, there's a depth to it, you know, it, this isn't a transient, just uh, passing by sort of contact, it, it's a kind of depthful contact where Trevor understands the group in ways that even we don't, you know, because he's kind of morphed the 70s and 80s, uh, as far as Yes is concerned. But, I mean, he's very much a now person, I mean, he's about what, 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 what have you got, what can we do, what have I got, what can I add? So it's it's really like a building process. It's almost like a huge uh, construction job, you know, where you're kind of constructing the foundations and then you know then then you eventually put in the leather seats and the telephones uh, in, into the building. But basically, we're we're I think it's going to be pretty good. But I, I you know one one always loves what you're actually doing in recording terms. What you're doing at the moment is it usually feels like the best thing you've ever done. And it doesn't always turn out to be the best thing you've done, but it certainly feels like the best thing you've done. So maybe this one will actually turn out to be like the best thing we've done, because there is a potential that for a long time we haven't set the bar, you know, for yes in this era. Uh, we did a bit, you know, in, as I said, with, with magnification. Now, I, I take it this album's uh, digital? Digital, yeah, yeah. We're, we're digital guys. I mean, it, it would be foolhardy to start trying to make an analog al album of this complexity with, with the choices that we want to be able to have, because so much is about post-production now. You know, record stuff, mm -hmm. and then you develop it, even after you've recorded it, you know, and uh, that's that's somewhat inevitable. But with Berrigan, we do have a responsibility to make records that sound like we play them together, you know, which is fundamentally what we do anyway. But obviously, you know, you can get records that are like, you know, music on steroids because, uh, it, you know, it just didn't, it just wasn't a loving experience, you know. But I, I think that's what we're doing. We're, we're trying to make a, a particular kind of record that's, that's suitable and lives up to our dreams and, their, and our audiences. Another thing, too, we should mention is that you've been keeping real busy in the studio. You uh, recorded with Asia, Omega, the album, and you know... Yes. Steve Howe Trio traveling album, so you've been keeping really busy. Well, also Motif was my solo guitar record I brought out a little while back, and Homebrew 4. So I, I, I like to, I mean, it's not that I like to be productive. It, it is a natural part of me to be productive. You know, if I'm, if I'm unproductive, <laughs> you, know, you definitely know I'm not happy, because my productivity is partly what makes me happy, yeah. So I've been recording, I mean, the Asia project went well. We, we, uh, we now did two albums, Phoenix and, and Omega, and, 
you know, I'm very proud of Asia too. You know, I love John's uh, writing and his bass playing and his singing. Uh, I've seen him come from such a place that you wouldn't want anybody to be to such a place of strength, you know. And, uh, of course, Carl Palmer is, is an incredible drummer who wins an audience over almost uh, after about three beats. <laughs> yeah. All these together his head. And, obviously, Jeff and I go back, uh, you know, a long way together through through drama with Yes and then through the, the early stages. Of, and we're all great team together, keyboard, guitar, you know, it, it, it's a strength. So, generally, I would say that Asia is the most sensible, one of the most sensible bands as far as making records. We we get a com- you know we get a selection of material. There's this few of my songs kicking around in there, and basically we get on with it uh, and we make life. We don't make life difficult for ourselves, and uh, we we've enjoyed making those two records. So you know who knows who might, might make another one. I don't know. And you're going on tour with Asia in uh, April. That's right. We we start the 28th. Um, and we do uh, a sort of shortest tour, about three weeks into into May, before we most probably do some South American dates and then some UK European dates, which kind of brings us round to about the 18th of June. So there's a nice run for Asia, just a sort of uh, nothing's too stressful there. None of the legs are too long. Um, you know, we, we're just happy to um, you know to find our feet. You know, having you know been back, back together for about. Well, this will be five years, so um, you know it's 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 been quite a reunion, and the fact that it's all original members, kind of you can sort of understand why we're doing it more, I think, than than if it. Well, I don't think we'd be doing it if it wasn't original members, is what I'm saying. And also, we should add that Yes is having a tour in March. That's right. We have a um, a, a nice little comfortable tour uh, where we're we're working. Um, Working our markets, we're starting down south, and we're ending up in the east uh, after Florida um, when the weather gets a little better. Last year we did a February tour, and that was, that was very adventurous. So we're but basically, yes, is a it's a touring band. You know, it, it, it's fundamental to our existence that we find niches to go out and play in our different territories. And um, you know, th- th- this is one that, as I said, we did last year in February. We've moved it down a month. Uh, it's not what you call a major market tour. We d- we do some secondary markets. We do a bit of casinoing, and uh, basically, it's a kind of um, stepping stone towards the summer. We didn't want to not tour until July, but by doing this, we're kind of striking a balance between our recording project and then the summer tour when the album comes out. One thing I I should ask is like um, going to recording techniques, like compared to a fragile album to today, would you say there's a big difference in the you know the way you guys record now? But yeah, I, I mean it's a it's a phenomenal difference. It, it's it's a very enjoyable difference in in most ways. Of course, what what you've got is what you've got. You know, it's like asking yourself, say you were in two seven, 1972 and you're driving a car. Uh, let's think, I was driving a car, it was called an NSU R080, they, they never really came to this country, but it was a great little car, it had a Wankel engine, it was very futuristic, but at that time, that was a very, very modern car, it looked very modern, it looked far more modern than anything, but it broke down, <laughs> it mm-hmm. didn't work very well. Um, so, like, if you look at it now, you've got in a car today, you know, you've got ABS, maybe four-wheel drive, you know, you've got cruise control, you know, you're running on uh, unleaded gas, you know. So, you know, as much as the driving's changed, I- I'm a bit of a driving fanatic, really, I suppose, but but the driving's changed, the recording's changed, you know, they've, they've, rec- they've changed, the, because now, of course, cars are full of computers also, and that's what recording is, so really, to strike it, right where it is. It's because of the computer the recording's so different and we welcome that because, you know, I used to like, I used to like, you know, I mean, I've always liked listening to music in a studio and the way that you can zoom in on particular sounds. For instance, you can listen to the bass drum on its own, you know, with nothing else playing. But that's all very well but in the 70s, but when you listen to the bass drum now on, on its own in digital, obviously, you know, you can do a lot more to it. You You, you know, you can change the pitch, you could change where that beat is in, in the bar if you wanted to, or you could move it, a microcosm, just to make it feel better. Um, you could also treat that one particular beat, just one beat in the whole song, you could treat differently. You could put a vast reverb on like the last beat of the bar. You could go, I could go on and on, bore you tears, but basically, you could, you, 
there's so much, like I said earlier, you can so much you can do in post-production now. It's astounding. And it's the same with a movie. I mean, when Hitch, Hitch, Hitchcock shot Psycho, he had to get the picture right. But now, if Hitchcock was still alive, he could, he could, you know, invent that shower. He 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 could uh, digitally uh, enhance it. You know, he could add the blood afterwards. But Hitchcock had to get it all right, and that's as different. We've got an interesting comparison, really, cars and films, with the way we record music. It's really the same. I mean, we've endorsed, adopted, and uh, gone down the line with the technology. And at first there was all that reluctance in the 80s, oh, digital, you know, the purists were like, oh, oh, digital's horrible, oh, I hate digital. And now we can't live without it. It's like a camera. I mean, do you want an old analog camera, you know, the one that you put the film in and have to pull it across the gate of the back and then close it quickly so the light didn't get in it? That sounds archaic. No, you've got a digital camera, you've got your stick. Hmm. You know? So really, if you think about that, it's exactly the same for recording. So yeah, it's changed vastly. And, and, and there's, there's, only, there's only a few areas that aren't improving. Uh, one could argue that the whole process of the way we listen to our music, certainly on an MP3 or an iPod or anything like that, that's rubbish. I mean, in quality terms, those things are not anywhere near even as good as a CD. A uh, CD, an, an essay CD, is about as good as you can get it today if you've got an SAC, SA CD player to play it on. But basically, a super audio CD is it, pretty damn good. So the, the quality has gone up, but the, the, the feel, in other words, the old-fashioned, it's almost like the old-fashioned feel. You, know, you say the same thing on a camera. Look at an early Leica camera, the lens. Look at a nice early Mercedes, you know. Look at a, you know all the things that we know. A lovely film like uh, The Sound of Music. You almost couldn't make that's an analog. It's all analog, early. So I, I I still think there is a conflict between going forwards. You know, but that's the same with everybody who gets older. They say it used to be better. People used to be friendlier. It used to be warmer. Uh, it used to be cheaper. Everything used to be better in the old days. And and what's better about it is it felt right. You know. And uh, sure, digital is a bit of a, uh, it's a bit cold, it's a bit icy. So we've, we've learned to warm up the, the digital world so that it's kind of enhanced almost with a reflection of analog. So that you can even make a, a digital sound sound analog, you know, just by putting a box over it, you know, a, a plug-in that, that analyzes the digital sound. Can you imagine? We've got all these ways of digital, and now we're analyzing, you know, making a digital sound sound like an analog because we like the warmth, because mm. there was something beautiful, you know. A, a record is actually a pretty good sound, even though everybody thought it was shit, you know, when cassettes came along. That's, cassettes were shit. But a record actually has the potential to be a very, very high quality sound because there's warmth. There's warmth in the bass. So it's taken a while for digital to get warmed up, and that's what it needed to do. So uh, that's a very extremely long answer to your question. But I do have 20 minutes more if you want to talk longer. I saw you were down for five or ten minutes. I've never said anything in five or ten minutes that's worth printing. Let me say that. <laughs> it's too short. <laughs> Any time you like. If you want another 10 minutes, that's fine. If you want 15, that, I, I, we can talk until half past, if you want. But if you've only got a couple of questions, then we will finish early. But you just, just see where it goes, if you like. But I'm, I haven't got a, a, a rush after this, all right? All right, good stuff. Um, talking about your guitars that you're playing today on this album that we've yet to hear, are you playing the classic guitars that you from your collection? Yeah. Yep. Um, I mean, you know, the 175, my 1964, 175... Gibson uh, comes in for all the crucial, most important things, mainly improvising, where I have a nice theme to play, I'll get that guitar, and then I'm going to stretch out on it. Um, I, 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 there's one track that really does get, I get, you know, the steel guitar comes out, the Fender, Jewel String Master, whatever it's called, I think it's called a Jewel String Master, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, it's called a Dual, dual string master professional but it's a remarkable steel guitar so I, I use and I'm using like my Les Paul Junior my Fender Telecaster, Stratocaster yeah I mean more, you know, when you ask me about modern guitars that, that's a pretty unusual question because you know, I don't play a lot of really really new guitars except Line 6 uh, Line 6 I use the Variax which I think is a remarkable guitar it's got about 20 different guitars in the same guitar 
all digital modeling uh, and there's you know, n no MIDI delay or any nonsense like that. It's perfectly usable, very cheap guitars that have this you know, array and certain sounds and you have to find them yourself are spectacular in there. The 335, the Les Paul, they're all really great sounds. So that's a guitar I use. Uh, certainly I've got my old traditional guitars we've been talking about, Tele, Strat, 175. Uh, I haven't used the stereo on this album yet, but that's another great classic uh, yes-sounding guitar. So yeah, I, I I go across that. Amps, yeah, I use a little bit more Vox, uh, AC50, Marshall 50, Line 6, Vita. Uh, and the Fenders, you know, I've had a funny look. I've used Fenders for most of my life, but just every now and again, I, I just can't get on with them. They, they rattle, they buzz, they... They're annoying or something, you know, uh, they let me down and I get cross and I've got most probably about 15 Fenders back home. Mm. And uh, at the moment I'm not touring or using a whole lot of Fenders. But every now and again, I must confess, a twin, you know, it, it, a Fender Twin's a great amp to have and we use those as well. So I have a twin as well. But I have about 25 guitars here. Uh, you know, I have a Fender, a, mandolin, a Gibson mandolin. I have a Fender electric mandolin. So I have a little selection, I say little, of of instruments that I basically uh, think are important. I have a Gretsch, you know, for that time when I say that sounds wrong. That doesn't sound right. Let's play on the Gretsch. So there are certain times where the characteristic of a guitar cries out to me. You know, this is wrong. Get another characteristic. So. Um, Slightly inspired by the development of keyboards in itself made me aware that keyboards sound phenomenally different. A PPG, you know, uh, an EMS, uh, a Moog, uh, a Prophet, you know, they're all very different. And I started to think, wow, guitars are the same. Rickenbackers, Dan Electros, Gretsch's, Gibson's, Fender's, you know, they're all different. And, and I'm the guy who, his ears are so tuned to this that I distinctly notice the changes. And I distinctly want to change, even though my favorite guitar is a, such a joy to play. I just cannot play it all the time. It does not do everything, even though it does most, most of what I want, the 175. But it doesn't do a steel guitar. It doesn't do a tremolo arm stray. It doesn't do a telly back pickup. It doesn't do those. So that's why I have these other guitars. And I love guitar collecting. I'm constantly, uh, well, not constantly, but periodically. I go on the internet. I'm on Gurren guitars. I'm on Gary's guitars. I'm on mandolin. Yeah, I'm looking at these guitars going, wow, hang on, you know, should I or should I not? Oh, my one's worth, you know, so I constantly inform myself by staying in touch with the guitar collecting world. And also I sell guitars, you know, I mean, I've, I've obviously got far too many, mm -hmm. you know, and I once had 175. Now that's nothing compared to some collections I've seen. I've seen a collection of 750 guitars, one person owned 750 guitars. So I wasn't actually that bizarre. Uh, I went to 175 and thought, this is ridiculous. I don't even know uh, uh, whether I can find a guitar I want. I've got to get them down. So I got it down to 100. And basically, I've been kind of crawling down. But there again, new things come out. And then I get another one or, you know, I need something, I get it. And Martin have been fantastic. You know, obviously, we've developed the two Steve Howe models now, the 0018 Steve Howe and the M338 Steve Howe. So those are, you know, I have a few of those. So, uh, and the same with Gibson, we've got the 1964 Steve Howe 175, which I'm also really proud of. So I, I'm really spoiled. I mean, I, I am spoiled with guitars. Uh, but it was something I set up in my own mind where I was going to try and buy everything in the Gibson catalogue. Hmm. And as I was just doing that, I realized I didn't actually want all those guitars. I wanted part of what was in the Fender catalogues and part, part was in all the other uh, things. So I just became an ardent collector, but also what I collect that very few people collect is M2 guitars. And uh, although they, one of the reasons they don't get collected is they don't increase in value. They're the most underrated M2 in the entire world. Strange enough, because, let me just finish, if, because the vintage guitars, which is like 1950s, because they're worth so much money, you know, a 58 less poor can be worth anything from a quarter to half a million dollars. I mean, that is insane. Mm. But an antique guitar is only one of in the entire world that I bought, say, 40 years ago, is not worth one penny more now than it is when I bought it. Now, that is ridiculous. I mean, my guitar should have escalated by four to 600% in, in that time. And I'm not bitching that they didn't, but I just think it's a missed opportunity for other collectors. And that's partly why it is 
people are missing it because there's no real appreciation for there's a couple of make, makes who do appreciate and the Ponormo guitar the Ponormo I have one of those that is worth money uh, good money and it has increased but not as much as a, an early violin uh, or an early flute which are very sought after and very they keep increasing like you know, Paul Vintage but uh, that, that's a peculiar thing but that's a particular I collect lyre guitars which stand up on their own so I have particular interests which are somewhat diverse from rock and roll. And uh, but after all, I love country music. You know, I love Alison Krauss and Union Station. They're my favourite band in the whole world. If, if I want to listen to something, it's Alison Krauss Union Station. And I've always had these diverse tastes. In other words, I'm playing in a prog band and I'm listening to Vivaldi, or I'm in Asia and I'm listening to jazz, or uh, you know what I mean? I'm in I'm in the trio and I'm listening to uh, Alison Krauss. I'm never strictly conforming to my musical um, work. In other words, I'm most probably fighting my musical work. In other words, if I'm doing prog, I've got to have an outlet that is nothing like prog. So I listen to a lot of music that seems on the surface to be completely irrelevant to my musical world, but, but it isn't, because it is yet another place I'm going, another step. And there's going to be a, a release later this year that I, I, I'm still keeping secret until we announce it, it's going to be on a major label. It's a completely different solo album that I finished and is completely, you know, completely finished. It must already be out in September. So again, what I'm not, I'm not trying to show people this, but it seems that I am showing people that I am reinventing myself, and that's the best way I think to have a career. I mean, after Salvador Dali did the same thing, he didn't paint serialist, serialistic paintings all the time. You know, he had different eras. And I think that's what artists do, or good artists need to do, is not just go, oh, I'm a serialist, I'm just going to paint serialist, and, and then for 50 years paint serialistic pictures. No, it's the same with me. I'm not going to play prog guitars for 50 years. I haven't. I've played Spanish guitars, I've played steel guitars, I've played country music, I've played jazz a bit. So basically that is enjoyable to me. It would be awful if I'd only played in 12-bar mode, and I was a blues guitarist. I, to me, that would have been driving me crazy. I think I would have committed suicide with the blues, because I, I cannot play one kind of music and be content. And the blues is a fascinating... I said something the other day, I could play 12 bars all night. I mean, I do like 12 bars, I do like the blues, but I will not be confined to one kind of music. Because speech... Uh, sorry, Jason. But <laughs> that, that, that does great. Speech. That, that's where I'm coming from. I will not conform, and I will not stand still. <laughs> <laughs> Going to a, a character like Robert Johnson, what, what's your uh, take on someone like him? Well, you know, funny enough, that's a great question. Last night I was, uh, I was reading some of Keith uh, Richards' book, and he talks about Robert quite a bit in there. And, and, and I've really tried to connect with Robert Johnson, but what happened to me was I connected with somebody else. I see somebody else who's a little bit later and a bit more, uh, well, a little bit later, Big Bill Brunsey. To me, if I'd not heard Big Bill Brunsey, I don't know, I, I would be a very, very different person. Because, you see, I like, uh, like Robert Johnson was, I like country blues, not city blues. You know, city blues is electric, country blues is acoustic. And, and, and I think it's highly inspiring, you know, to, to be able to tap into that country blues. So for me, Big Bill Brunsey was everything that Robert Johnson is to a lot of other people. He's, he's not as technical, and he's not as, you know, like, maybe he wasn't as clever, but, but what came with Big Bill Brunsey was what I needed uh, to, to, to have that kind of belief in, in, in that music, it, 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 because of the voice as well, because he was such a great singer. Uh, Brunsey kind of encapsulated that, because I tried Lead Belly, you know, and I tried Robert Johnson, but I did like, um, the guys I did like were Lightning Hopkins, Muddy Waters, Buddy Guy on his early records, just like Keith Richards. I agree with Keith Richards completely that, you know, Buddy Guy somewhere along the way just, like, you know, was trying too hard. But before he started trying too hard, he had the most brilliant voice and guitar interplay I've ever heard. So, I mean, the blues is really important, but obviously I was, I was playing the blues before the in crowd, uh, before tomorrow, before my later 60s groups but I, you know basically my early groups were blues groups and I did go around playing the blues um, 
But I suppose I was always hearing a more jazzy sort of blues, you know, because I saw Wes Montgomery when I was 16. And on stage, he was amazingly bluesy, much more so than on his, uh, on his recording. But, I mean, you know, Robert Johnson, the, the, I, I'm always trying to understand how I can access this guy. I've got the box set with all his recordings, you know. Uh, it's just I'm quite, I never connected with him as much as Bill Brunsey. So, um, you know, the blues has had a, a big effect on rock, not one that I particularly wanted it to have. You know, I, I, I mean, I wanted it to have an effect, but I didn't want every rock guitarist be, to become a blues guitarist, which did happen. And that's, that's when I really dug my heels in. And that's when I said to myself, I will not play blues cliches anymore. You know, I never played... Da, 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 you know what I mean? I don't do it. You know, although it's fun and I like doing it in private, I don't... In my career, in my recording work and on my stage work, I, I, I don't do a lot of blues. I might do occasional blues and on a few of my solo albums, there's something like... There's a track called Inside Out Muse, which is a blues. And so I obviously do like it. But it's got to be kept under control, otherwise, <laughs> you know, it's quite contagious. It's quite easy to sit there and, you know, just revel in, in a 12 bar. So I guess what you're hearing is really that you're hearing somebody who likes it, but is also scared of it, because I think it, I didn't want it to pigeonhole me. I didn't want to stay with the blues. You know, I had to move on. Let's take a completely different uh, picture of, of us here. Let's say your inspirations to create a masterpiece like Mood for a Day. What was your um, feelings that day that you made that? Well, um, construction, a musical construction is really tantalizing. In other words, it could have started... Uh, you know, it would have been wrong. It had to start with... You know. So finding that out is not easy. You know, it's a difficult... I mean, <laughs> it's arduous almost you've got these tunes and you've got to work out how, what the running order of them is and that, that that's partly what i spend quite a lot of time in composition is really what happens first what happens next and how does it end <laughs> mm. <laughs> it's a really simple way of talking about composition how does it start what happens in the middle and how does it end and that's one of preoccupation that i have also i don't really think about it quite so mundanely but mood for day was um was uh, most of my pieces come along they drift into my consciousness uh, kind of slowly you know i might have part of it and i'll be thinking about that for a couple of years and then suddenly it'll all come together with another part you know so it's almost like the icing on the i uh, waiting for the icing to come so i can put it on the cake and say it's over you could say it's like that um but basically mood for day was was a brave step in in a new direction because at that, that point I'd only written a few instrumental pieces, Clap being the main piece, and then I felt I wasn't going to follow Clap with another Chet Atkins style country picking, you know. So uh, you know I had a nice Spanish guitar. My wife bought me a Contreras, and um, but just before that happened, I basically recorded Mood for Day on a Condo guitar, which is a, 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 a I don't know it's handmade, but it was a, a proper Spanish guitar. And that uh, flamenco guitar um, was what I was, you know, aspiring to, if you like. I was trying to find out how I could convincingly, since I've recorded Clap, how I convincingly do something like that. But it, it was a different style of music, but it was on a Spanish guitar. That, to me, was the challenge that I had in front of me. And lo and behold, the whole of Yes decided, we, had, we decided to all do a solo piece on Fragile, which meant that, there was room then for Mood for Day on Fragile, um, following uh, Clap on the S album quite closely. So I was thrilled with that. But yeah, that, that's an ecliptic piece. I mean, you know, it was the first Spanish guitar piece I'd ever written. You know, to follow was the Leaves of Green song, Tales and Telegraphic Oceans, and then, you know, Surface Tension and, and other tunes that I wrote for Beginnings and the Steve Howe album. So basically, that, that, that was, all, like Clap was, it was the first, and Mood for Day was the first of me getting confident and, and getting compositional on these pieces. I don't, I don't know what I can say about it other than it, the title summed it up perfectly because it, it wasn't really a piece that started and the tune developed. It was really different themes that, that were linked together. And I, I slightly developed them as the tune goes down, but, but there were key pieces. I, I, I do truly love Mood for Day. I, I, I could say that Clap and Mood for Day 
if I had to, if I didn't write anything after those, I would still be quite happy because those two pieces were quite formidable in themselves. The fact that I've now written about 35 guitar solos of my own, including sketches in the sun, you know, Ram and, and, and uh, you know, a lot of others, that, that, that's enjoyable. You know, in fact, Motif, um, which came out a couple of years ago, has uh, no less than four new, new solo pieces on it. It's slightly concealed on that album of re-recordings because I've never really pulled together a CD where you could actually hear me playing continuously in, in solo mode because, you know, like, like we said, Clap was on a, a, an AES album. And that kept happening. My solos would be seen as a as a, a, a as a relief in in, in another um, context, you know, like it is on a stage show when yes or Asia break and they say, oh, Steve's going to do a solo. That to me is an opportunity to keep my solo career, my solo guitar work alive, because otherwise it's pretty dead. I mean, I've been busy with yes and Asia for years now and hardly had time to do any solo shows. But but I have because each night I play two tunes. And I change those tunes every night I play, it, it, as much as I want or as much as I can. And uh, if I go to a country I've never been to, like Paraguay, I play Mood for a Day and Clap, because they, they've never heard me play, they've never seen me play. So I, I went to Paraguay in, in, in November, and, and that's what I did. So if I've never been to a country, I will play my two strongest pieces. But if I'm touring America, or Europe, or, or Japan for that matter, I will you know, change my pieces every night. So if people do come to more than one night, they usually see me play different pieces, which reinstates what I'm saying is that mm -hmm. I keep my, my solo playing alive while I'm in the groups, and uh, I need to do that. So um, that gives me a moment of uh, flashing back. You know, I mean, we, we can be having, you know, if we're having a great group show, that's great. I can have a nice spot. But, you know, if you're having a tough group show and then suddenly I'm playing guitar and you see me smiling, <laughs> you know that I always feel the joy when I'm playing solo, you know. Basically, I could sum it up like this, that that is why I'm doing all this, you know. Uh, that music, Clap, Mood for a Day, and all the other 30 pieces that follow are much more about what I am than Yes or Asia will ever be. You know, there's, obviously there's 100% of me in those tunes and take sketches in the sun. That piece, uh, you know, I love to play on, on acoustic guitar, and now, uh, after recording it on an electric 12-string down electro on, on the other, on, on GTR back in the 80s. But, so I, I developed the, 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 the sound of a tune, after, sometimes after it's written. Um, but usually, um, it, it, the compositions are quite family-oriented. You know, what with Clap being for Dylan, what's the tunes I've written are for my family. Uh, that, that, that's a moment I can, I can show my love and respect for them. And, uh, you know, Second Initial wasn't a solo piece originally, but um, George's theme, all, all these tunes, uh, Jay's theme, you know, so all these things, they, they, they're, they're very much, they're where my depth is, if you like. You know, where the well of my love is, is, uh, is, is, is it's being voiced by these uh, solo compositions. Let's say you're going to a gig or something. Can you recall your repertoire quite quick? Um, and now which which part of the repertoire are you referring to? Let, let let's say with all the you know discography you've ever created, which is uh, really big. Yeah. Let's say somebody names you a song in an evening, or I don't know. Can you dig that out of your head that quick? Pretty much so. A remarkable thing did happen. Uh, if I am party. Or I wrote, if I write or I, I am party to writing a song or a tune, it never goes away. It, it's always in my mind. I can always play it. So somebody said to me today, I mean, I've done the test. There are radical exceptions, but I mean, it, you know, like Sound Chaser by Yes is one of the most daunting, scary, techno, crazy pieces we ever did. And I can play parts of it, you know. But like when Yes say, oh, look, shall we play this song or that song? I'm usually the guy that can remember quite well but then I go and research it and, and learn it meticulously but yeah I do have a lot of the repertoire I mean I did a tour two years ago where I played with Asia and yes and people said how are you going to do that I mean how are you going to you know one minute and it was really easy you know different guitars and different clothes and I could just switch over to one set or another but but what I do enjoy is the question you asked me is that I do seem to remember most of what I of what I invent and it does stay there so it's easier 
and that's why keeping in touch with my solo pieces is nice on these tours. <clears throat> but but I do that sound check. You know, I might play two or three pieces at sound check and play two different pieces at the concert, so that I'm I'm always uh, refreshing my memory. But yeah, one of my tests when I play the guitar, I like to explain. I don't practice. I don't believe in practicing. I never have. It's not because I've been playing 50 years that I say this. But I've never believed that practicing was interesting. It was really boring going da 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 da. da. But it, it's good to get to movement to get your muscles working. But as soon as you can. Don't do that. Improvise. You know? And the key to my survival as a musician is improvisation. And I sit and improvise, but in that improvisation, suddenly I'll think, I'd like to play, uh, let's say, you know, I'd like to play uh, Jay's theme, you know. And I'll, I'll start playing it and attempt to play that perfectly, and yet I haven't played it for three months, or maybe even a year. But I will go for it, almost if I'm on stage. I'm just enjoying myself sitting in my guitar room playing. And, but I always have a recording, you know, I can always record. So, because that's where I get most of my, my writing comes from improvisation. It doesn't come from me sitting at a piano w w with a stave of music and a pen. You know, I can't think like that. All I can do, the way I develop music is to write. So every now and again, I'll play one of my pieces, uh, like, like, even like Surface Tension. That's, that's not an easy piece to play. But I'll start playing it and I'll go to myself, this has got to be right. I mean, you, you're going to play this perfectly and you're going to remember everything. So if I don't remember something, I'll be pretty surprised. But so that's my way of practicing and staying in touch with my music, and that's the way. That's how important this uh, playing the guitar is. I, I thought it would, the novelty might have worn off by now, but I'm still a complete guitar fanatic, and and I'm really really surprised at that because uh, it goes in waves. You know, waves of collecting guitars and not collecting so much, the waves of playing and not playing so much, and then the waves of writing and not writing so much so there's a kind of process almost like a rippling effect where if i'm doing a lot of touring i might not be doing so much writing but then if i'm doing some recording i might be doing more writing there's a kind of mishmash of uh, what my requirements are as a guitarist what i'm expected to do as a guitarist it kind of they wave you know uh, uh, and if i'm playing live i haven't got a lot more time for much else but then in the winter is a good time to write music, and if, I'm not usually touring in June, January, and February. I never used to do anything, and I just used to write uh, in in the country, in England, back home. But but now I you know I take more work, and yes, a recording, and blah blah blah. So you know th there'll be different years that I don't do what I prefer to do, but th I'll make up for it. And um, you know, writing is 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 very very important. So the three things I do, writing performing and recording are all equally in competition with each other and I I enjoy all of them equally. I mean, you know, writing is very engrossing. I mean you can sit for hours just just contemplating how you're gonna do something. You know, it, it's fascinating. This started with you asking me how I wrote Mood for a Day about ten minutes ago. And I think your questions have been quite uh interesting because, you know, I, I don't like interviews that the answer is yes. Well, the other answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> so you've given me questions that I've had to address. You know, I've had to come up with things to say. I love it. So one final here, uh, Steve. When is the Steve Howe book coming out? Well, yeah. Um, you had the Steve Howe guitar collection, and then uh, quite a few years ago I started talking uh, about the fact that I'd written up quite a lot of my book. Um, and what I did, I got up to 1972, I think, in my book. And, and that was quite an achievement. And what happened was um, that I've had so much other things to do that, you know, I haven't really addressed that uh, very much. So, but I have a plan. Uh, the, the plan is about expansion. It's a bit like music, really. I look at those 15,000 words and think, right, well, that isn't quite right. It isn't quite thick enough. There isn't quite enough depth. So I want to bring a little more to it. So really, when I get another block period, uh, when I can get back to it, I will been a couple of years it's been sitting there um you know kind of prettily holding itself together in in my computer and uh, of course it, what it's about is uh, a work you know a work in music you know work in music really it's about um it's it mainly connects about my i found that uh it's not easy to and i noticed this with bob dylan and other people's books is that if you're writing about your career uh, I mean, Bill Bruford's book is slightly different, I think. But if you're writing about QE, you don't really write about your personal life much. You know, because 
you, you, if you're going to spend 15,000 words talking about your career, how can you not spend 30,000 words talking about the love of your life? But how can you do that? You know, um, I do it through poetry, I do it through music, you know, so in other words, it's only going to be about part of my life, uh, the part that people already know something about, but they'll know more about it, uh, and, and they'll know more about what I think about what was going on. But um, I still know that there's a big divide about that between that and, and my actual personal life, and, and not that my family don't come into it, because of course, of course they do, they can't help but come into it, but they, but they can't justify the meager way that they come into it with any real importance that they have or, uh, to me. They are more important than everything else that's going on. It's just that I have to talk about my music and I have to do my music. It's my job. And I love that too. But, um, you know, so my book will be about my work and uh, I hope it will be insightful and quite guitaristic because um, that's that's what I'm all about. So, um, and I hope to finish it um, maybe even next year, you know, get it finished next year. Uh, I don't think there's a big rush. I mean, Bill's book, Bill's book was very illuminating. It wasn't about Yes in particular, although Rick brought out a book, it sounded like it was about Yes, but it also wasn't. So I think my book won't be about Yes either, but it will have a central theme. There will, the central theme, theme may be Yes. You know, and my other bands will, will feature in it, and my solo work will feature in it a lot. But like I'm saying, you know, don't expect to hear what I do at home. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> A little of that, but um, so this, I'm a private person, basically, even though I'm, I love to talk and people ask me questions all my life and I answer them, uh, but there again, there's much of me that you don't know about, <laughs> and that's going to stay the same, even when you read my book, but, you know, I will get it finished, um, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I think it might be a realistic plan to have it out by 2012. Well, Steve, thank you for uh, this great classic interview because I'm sure it's going to be great All right. well thank you very much for the time right, then, Jason well it's very nice um, thanks for that because I see it's going to be a, a partly radio and partly print that's, that's super yep. so uh, are you in Nova Scotia yes I live in Nova Scotia Canada yeah. amazing place I, 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 I've only been there once I think um, in 1992 I came there with Asia on a uh, not not a big grand tour, but like you know, uh, more like a club tour. And uh, we played Halifax. Of course, in February it was stunningly cold, and my I had to get my car plugged in. I had a diesel car at the time. Of course, we had to plug it in the uh, mains uh, outside the hotel. But that that was an amazing experience, and uh, it's quite a country. It must be great in the summer though. It's really lovely. Summer's better than the winter, Steve. <laughs> right. But you like winter sports, don't you? You like all the hockey. Oh, well, we're all hockey fans, yeah. Of course you are. Because it's, it's bread, isn't it? I mean, it's what you do. It's what you enjoy because it's what you can do with the environment. It's an amazing environment. All right, then, Jason. Well, thanks very much. Hope to catch you sometime. Say hello. Uh, enjoy the show. Enjoy the music. For sure. I look forward to meeting you someday. All right, then, Jason. Say hello. All right. You have a great evening. You too. It's now. Bye now.